This is the uh, 50th anniversary since my first book uh, came out. And there are probably some people here whose parents were not born when my book came out. Uh, so it's, it was a very long time ago. Uh, the, the, the present book is uh, supposed to be a follow-up to that. It has an entirely different title, and for good reason. The, the, we've learned a lot in the last 50 years. And I've tried to reflect that in, uh, in, in what I've been, uh, been writing. I've had a good, uh, uh, I'm going to sound a little immodest about this, but uh, I've had a good response on the book so far that uh, its greatest relevance is to Africa uh, because it's, it's particularly relative to low-income countries. It has something to say about middle-income countries, but it's a lesser proportion. Well. There are not many low-income countries left in Asia. There are a few. Uh, uh, Nepal, for example, where I've done a lot of work. It seems the ones I've worked in the most are still very poor, so uh, <laughs> that's a, sort of a bad sign about the whole thing. Uh, the, uh, in Africa, uh, I'm, I'm working directly with the uh, African Development Bank. I'm heading up a, a fairly large team because their next major report is going to be on agriculture. And I'm uh, consulting with the uh, Gates Foundation. They're having a big meeting here in Washington, and I think later this week or next week, I can't remember which it is, and also with AGRA. Uh, I'm very pleased by this, and I, I, I'm obviously enjoying uh, sharing it with you, that these three organizations, which are quite important in African development, are all centering uh, their future work on my book and, and the approaches in the book. I'm, I'll say a few words about what it is I think that they're grabbing hold of in, in, uh, in this pr process. I, I want to do two things in this presentation. I, I, I first of all uh, want to say a little bit about the, the model which is used in the book. There's a lot of quantification in the book of relationships between agriculture, poverty reduction, the economic transformation, and so on, and a lot of comparisons between high growth rates and low growth rates. And, I want to try and catch a little bit of the flavor of that. And then I want to run through a, a list of seven what I consider to be major departures from current practices in, in development of agriculture in low and medium income uh, countries. I, I think there are more than seven differences, but these are the seven I picked out. And uh, if, if I'm running short of time, uh, I'm just going to stop wherever I was, so I may not get through all all, all seven of, of, uh, uh, of those. Uh, the, uh, can't remember, you're doing this. Yeah, uh, we've got to get a signaling system here that I have to understand. Uh, the, the modeling for this book is very simple-minded. Uh, there's a paper by Peter Hazel and his colleagues uh, that provides the justification for the simple-minded approach, and I'm very grateful to Peter for having made it look okay to, uh, uh, to do that. Uh, I'm basically modeling three household sectors. There's, uh, the small commercial farmers, the rural non-farm, and the urban actually have a large commercial farmer sector in there, but it's, it's never all that important, and I just sort of left it out of the discussion here. The, I, I, to my surprise, I think where the, the, the book is having an impact because I make the small commercial farmer central to the whole process of agricultural growth and the economic transformation. And uh, the, the, the small commercial farmer is not a subsistence farmer. In other words, the smallest of them are above subsistence, and they're not urban-oriented in their consumption patterns, so they don't fall in the large-scale uh, group. Uh, in a country like Ethiopia, and I'll use a lot of Ethiopian uh, data as I talk here, uh, in a country like Ethiopia, uh, the small commercial farmer is basically between three-quarters of an acre and five acres in size. These are not big, rich people, but they're not poor. They are commercial. They sell a high proportion of what they produce. They make essentially all of their income from farming. Non-farm income for the people who are small commercial farmers is relatively unimportant. Uh, and 
they, they are producing around 85% of the agricultural output. They represent, uh, on the, you, it varies from country to country, obviously, but they represent about half of the rural households. The other big rural sector is the rural non-farm sector. That includes the subsistence and below subsistence farmers and a large landless class. And there are people who think, well, that sounds like Asia, but it's not Africa. But, but you look at, uh, at uh, Jain's work on, uh, at, from Michigan State University on, on Africa, and you find it's all not all that different to the Asian situation. And the Gini coefficients for rural African countries tend to be higher than the Gini coefficients in Asia. That means that the income distribution is more uneven in Africa than in Asia. Uh, so that this view, uh, well, if, if you want to take an extreme view on this, uh, Paul Collier and, and Stefan Durkan, uh, I find this quite incredible. People read their stuff on agriculture. They haven't a clue about agriculture, okay? Uh, they refer in their writing, they, they publish in things like World Development, which are otherwise are reputable journals. Uh, and they, they talk about farming as carried out by poor people who are basically subsistence farmers. Those are direct quotes from their articles, okay? Well, if you take an average, a simple average of size of farm for everybody in rural areas in African countries who have any land, guess where it comes out? It comes out as a, as a, as a subsistence farmer because you have a huge number of subsistence and below subsistence farmers and similar number above, you take the average and you have a subsistence farmer. But what I call a small commercial farmer produces 85% of the output. So if you want to increase agricultural production, that's where you have to work. Now, there's a problem there and you want to keep note of this. We have lots of macro data that show that agricultural growth brings about poverty reduction. But how can agricultural growth bring about poverty reduction if the agricultural growth is coming virtually entirely from people who are not poor? Uh, you have to have some kind of, of system by which income is transferred from those people to the, the rural non-farm people. And of course, that system is these small commercial farmers typically spend half of their incremental income in the rural non-farm sector. Uh, bus travel with conductors and so on from it, improvements in their house, of course a large number of services and, uh, and so on. Now wh when we tr try and model this, the key variables are the base employment, the base GDP production, and the employment elasticities. And uh, we can just run to the next, uh, next one now. Uh, I'm not going to spend much time on this table. I'm going to swing over to making some conclusions from it. But you basically have the sectors over here on the left and then the, the basic variables across on the top. And you can do the arithmetic and you can come out with the employment growth rate and the incremental employment. And uh, I, I, I took off the tables on GDP, but you can come up with uh, GDP growth rate, well, the GDP growth rate is here, and you can come up with the in incremental uh, GDP on it. I'm, I'm going to, uh, just in a moment, swing from this one, but if you look at the bottom of the table there, uh, the, the figure in parentheses is the uh, growth rate and the employment uh, growth rate uh, for a 3% agricultural growth rate. 3% in African countries where the, where the population growth rates are very rapid, a 3% agricultural growth rate is consistent with further increases in poverty. 3% uh, is what you should find happening with no modern institutional input, just the population growth rate and the little bit of innovating that farmers do on their own without a, an agricultural research system and so on. So 3% is what you'd expect in a high population growth rate area with no institutional development to bring uh, accelerated growth. The 6% uh, 
is first of all, it's a number that Cotup came up with. And you know, as you all know, IFPRI played a very important role uh, in, in development of Cotup. And that is, the, in a sense, the Bible uh, for agricultural development in, in Africa. Uh, all the chiefs of state signed off on it. They all knew, most of them knew they were lying when they signed on it, but uh, they did sign uh, uh, on it. Uh, so <clears throat> if you keep the urban growth rate constant at 8 percent, which is okay for Africa, uh, and change the agricultural growth rate from 6.4 to 3, I'm sorry, from 6 percent to 3 percent, the, the GDP growth rate drops from 6.4 to 4.7, the employment growth rate drops from 3.7 to 2.2. 2.2 is way below the population growth rate. <clears throat> so that means there's increasing poverty. Uh, we just switch to the next one. <clears throat> uh, the, these, uh, these numbers are taken right from the, uh, from the table that you were looking at. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> you can, we're, we're talking about, this is actually Ethiopian data. <clears throat> In other words, I'm doing an African low-income country. <clears throat> Ethiopia is a very low-income country. Uh, it's the only country in Africa in which agriculture has been consistently growing at better than the caught-up 6% growth rate for 20 years. So it's a big success story uh, in agriculture, but starting from an extremely uh, low base of poverty. Poverty's dropped in half, but it's still 25% of the, of the population. <clears throat> the, the rural non-farm base employment is two times the urban. And I want to make a, a very important point here. Rural non-farm, that's not agriculture, right? <laughs> uh, so what we're saying is that the non-agricultural population, the people making their living producing other than agriculture in a low-income country is two times the size of the urban one. Uh, nobody talks about that. All the literature gives you the impression that non-agriculture is entirely urban. Well, it's not true. Uh, and rural includes small towns, the market towns. The, the uh, data for, uh, for Ethiopia, mark, uh, market towns are counted as rural, and which is what they should be. The market for what they produce is from, from agriculture, not from the big cities and so on. <clears throat> now we compare the 6% with a 3%. GDP grows 36% faster if you keep the urban rate constant and double the agricultural growth rate from what I call nothing, which is 3% to 6%. Notice that the employment growth rate is far faster. It increases by 68%. And that's a, a very important point to keep in mind. You accelerate agricultural growth, of course you accelerate GDP growth, but you accelerate employment growth far more and that means you have a big, that's where your big impact on poverty comes. And we can say flatly, <clears throat> in a low-income country, if agriculture is growing slowly, <clears throat> poverty will not be decreasing, period, uh, no matter what you do in the non-agricultural sector. <clears throat> uh, the, the, uh, uh, with a 6% growth rate, the, uh, 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 the, the, the incremental employment the number of thousands of people that you add in employment to in the rural non-farm sector is three times the urban. So that what you're doing here is diffusing the urbanization pattern. <clears throat> if you neglect agriculture as a low-income country, <clears throat> your urbanization will concentrate in one or maybe two major cities, most likely the capital city, period. If agriculture grows rapidly, you do what happened in Europe and North America is you get a diffuse pattern of, of uh, urbanization. And it's a debatable point, but I think you can make a pretty good case. Uh, uh, let's pass that up, thank you. <clears throat> I think you can make a pretty good case uh, that that's desirable. And as, as all of you Americans know, Chicago used to be called a cow, turn, cow town. Why, why a cow town? Uh, because it depended on agriculture. And does it depend on agriculture now? Of course not. Uh, these, uh, these dispersed urban areas eventually get a life of their own which is detached from, uh, uh, from, from agriculture. <clears throat> what you do in the low-income stage 
has a big impact on the pattern of urbanization, which continues when you move into middle income status. If you don't get the high growth in the low income stage, you're not likely to get this dispersed urbanization uh, pattern. Now, I want to uh, go ahead and uh, uh, talk about the conventional wisdom. <clears throat> uh, the first point I want to make is that modernization of agriculture increases labor productivity. Of course, that's what it's all about. But it also increases the quantity of farm family labor. Uh, you, you, if you take a farm pre-modernization and then get technological change and so on, you'll find that after that technological change, there's far more family labor used in work on the farm. And where does that labor come from? We find in traditional agricultures, yields are much more variable than in a modernized agriculture, much more variable from farm to farm, and the, and, and the incomes are much more variable, both yields and incomes. And that's significantly because of tremendous variation from farm to farm in the incentive to earn income. And that difference is due to lack of inf in infrastructure. When you get modern infrastructure, you suddenly open up a very wide range of desirable things to spend money on. This appeals to A, that appeals to C, and so on. Everybody finds something appealing. Uh, and so the incentive to work goes up. I, I have a very nice story uh, that comes from India. <clears throat> uh, some of you know I, I lived for two years in a rural area in, uh, in India when it was a traditional agriculture. And I went back uh, uh, six years after I'd left. And in the meantime, the, the green revolution had come along. And I asked one of the farmers uh, who had one of the larger holdings in the, in the sample and whose yields were in the lower third of the distribution. What do you think about this green revolution? He said, it's just terrible, just terrible. He said, two things are bad about it. Number one, my wife is constantly taking the bus into Agra and spending money <laughs> buying things. Secondly, because of that, I have to work a lot harder than I used to. <laughs> well, uh, there's a lot in that story. He was working harder than he used to. Why was he working harder than he used to? For two reasons. The productivity of his labor had gone way up as a result of modernization, and the incentive to earn income had gone up because of the improvement in physical infrastructure. His wife could get to Agra easily. He didn't mention he goes there also but, uh, and spends money as well. Uh, but uh, the, the, the point is, big increase in labor input, almost entirely from, from farm family labor, not from increased hired, uh, hired labor. Uh, this is going to do the next one. Uh, the second thing I want to talk about is that in a low-income country, the, the things I'm saying about low-income countries are more or less correct for, for middle-income countries, but a little less so. In other words, it's, it's not as strong and because the proportion of agriculture is lower and so forth and, uh, uh, and so on. The, if you get 6% agricultural growth rate in a low-income country with no trade, and they tend not to trade uh, on agriculture and, and cereals, with no trade, there's not downward pressure on prices. And the reason for that is that you have a large rural non-farm population with very elastic demand uh, for cereals. The prospering small commercial farmers, they're spending, they spend about a, a, a quarter of incremental income on improving their food intake, qu quality, not, not quantity. They spend about a quarter on urban goods, television set and so on, and they spend half locally. They spend half locally because labor costs are very low and things that we use labor are very inexpensive, so those things compete very well with uh, uh, with urban things, so that uh, the the, uh, the 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 demand, the income of the uh, rural non-farm population shoots up because of expenditure of half of incremental income. That half comes from Peter Hazel, uh, but I think it's fairly well corroborated by a whole bunch of other studies at IFRI, including 
the, the overall review that Chris uh, Delgado did. So that 89 percent of incremental cigarettes production is consumed in rural areas, 65 percent by the rural non-farm sector. In other words, because the small commercial farmer spends a high proportion of incremental income on the rural non-farm sector, that sector has the income in order to increase their cereal consumption. And since they're very poor, they spend a high proportion of incremental income on cereals. And you have cereals consumption growing at a 4.2 percent rate uh, amongst these rural poor and a very rapid increase in food security uh, as a result of that. <clears throat> Just a, a final throwaway line at the end. Obviously, as incomes of the rural poor rise, the income elastic demand is going to decline. And therefore, you're not going to get as, as big a carryover into demand for the cereals that are being produced. But as that happens, the livestock consumption grows, and you get a big increase in demand for uh, livestock products so that you can have a, a very long period of, of two, three decades uh, of rapid growth in cereals production with no decline in, uh, uh, in price. And do the uh, third one. <clears throat> Uh, this is extremely important, the point I'm making here. I have never heard within a foreign aid program any of the gender specialists ever talk about a farmer's wife. The bulk of the influential women in rural areas are wives of small commercial farmers. Okay? And a lot of Westerners think that uh, somehow women in developing countries uh, have no influence on the family and so on. Of course, that's complete nonsense as any logical person would, uh, would find out. In a traditional agriculture, the wife probably had better, has better access to information important to making farming decisions than the husband has. So she has an informational advantage and obviously, information is power. So she's an important person. With modernization, the source of information for making farming decisions moves outside the village. And we tend to run institutions in such a way that the farmer's wife does not have access to that information. The extension programs are organized for male heads of households. Not for, not for female heads of households and certainly not for farmers' wives. Well, the, the solution to that problem is, and you, you can see what the results are, she has less influence on the farming. She has less influence on everything as a result, including the whole question of, of birth control and so on. Uh, you've just pushed her down in terms of, of power structure. She doesn't have access to the new jobs opening up. Uh, a prosperous small commercial farmer's wife is a logical person to be elected to the cooperative board, not if she doesn't know anything about fertilizer. Uh, so there's a serious problem here, and the solution is very simple. Uh, the, uh, and uh, some of the uh, seed or seed, uh, private sector seed companies practice this. All you have to do is set up demonstrations in which, which are made into social occasions as well as the technical part. The husband has to see to it that his wife comes if it's a social occasion. So the wives then come, she gets the information, she's back into having some control uh, in, in the uh, family. The impact of this is huge. Uh, the, uh, some people laugh when I say this, but uh, it's a statistical likelihood. Half the families in small commercial farmers the wife is smarter than the husband, right? I mean, half of them, she's stupider than the husband. That's a we won't <laughs> talk about that. Uh, you're, you're getting poorer decisions made if you freeze the wife out of this information. So it's very important. Because of that lack of information, she's not eligible to be tapped to be elected to the cooperative board and, uh, and so on. And she has lower capability for the rural non-farm sector. So this is a very important problem, and nobody talks about it. Uh, uh, how do I know all this? Because we had focus groups with farmers' wives, and, and they all complained bitterly about the situation. Uh, so it's a big problem. We go to the number, the next one. Uh, 
this what everybody knows that uh, research expenditure is grossly inadequate. <clears throat> Tanzania, which claims to be interested in agriculture, expect foreign aid to pick up three quarters of the cost of their grossly underfunded, underfunded agricultural research system. Uh, what does that tell you? It tells you they're not interested in agriculture. Uh, and uh, you're wasting your money working with them on that. A uh, number of African countries are spending one-sixth of a reasonable target amount on agricultural research. There's inadequate intensity. There's very poor commodity coverage. Uh, all of that's the core of modernization. Urban-oriented governments don't understand this. And uh, our foreign aid is an urban-oriented uh, uh, government. So, uh, uh, they tend not to understand this uh, either. Uh, grossly neglected in foreign aid, uh, the U.S. played the dominant role in the time of the Green Revolution in building the core of what's required to have a Green Revolution, that is, a agri national agricultural research system. You all know this because of the CGIR and so on, but uh, you, you may not be aware of how bad the situation is in Africa in the, in the national systems. Uh, if we go back to the golden age of aid to agriculture at the Green Revolution period, uh, foreign aid to help national systems was very large. And it's, it's been largely done away with uh, since then. Uh, and the problem is compounded. The, you know, I don't know where to start on foreign aid. It is so bad in agriculture that you, you, just, you just can't think about uh, uh, what to say about it. But foreign aid has in general been opposed to public sector extension systems. They're continually talking about private extension systems. I have no idea what a private extension system is. I've never seen one myself. Uh, they're private companies who do some extension, but here and there and specialized in that and so on. Uh, so you've had in African countries, very few of them developing an extension system which is carrying farmers' problems to research. It's always complaint that the researchers don't, don't know what they're doing. I'm going to run out of time, aren't I? Uh, okay. Uh, I think I'll, then I'll try and get one or two more of these in. Uh, one of the other things that foreign aid has done is said you shouldn't have a specialized agricultural finance system so that essentially no African country, there are one or two exceptions, essentially no African country has a proper uh, agricultural extension uh, uh, system. Uh, I'm going to take my last 23 seconds just to make a couple of quick points, and you can just stop on this. That there is no middle income country achieving rapid growth in agriculture. They're all around 4%, uh, which is pretty marginal for reducing uh, poverty. Why? Because their agricultures are more than half in livestock and horticulture, the demand for which is growing at 8 or 9%, and they aren't emphasizing livestock and horticulture. Serious problem in, in low and middle income uh, countries. I'm going to stop there. Uh, I've, I've got 12 seconds I'm giving up. Uh. John, we will happily give you a minute or two to go to your last slide. Well, actually, the, the last, all right, I'll make it just a final. The, the seventh thing, I just ran through them very quickly. Uh, foreign aid in general is not in favor of planning. I have no idea why that is. Uh, every private company has plans and strategies and so forth and so on, but developing countries aren't supposed to uh, uh, do it. You cannot develop agriculture in a low-income country unless you have a clear plan backed by the prime minister because you have to get the government on board. You need government action. You have to have all sorts of government policies and, and institutions built. It has to be on board. You need to mobilize the small commercial farmer. In Ethiopia, the 63,000 extension agents that they have in Ethiopia, never mind how well they're trained. They're, thought, they're well thought of by farmers, by the way. Uh, they're not very well trained. 63,000 extension agents carry the concept of the plan and the importance of the farmer to the national targets and so on. And that, you know, there's sort of this view that Farmers are only interested in money, or, or more than likely, they're not interested in anything. Uh, but they are interested in their country. And when you have a plan 
that is carried out and they're told by 63,000 extension agents that they're important to their country, that has an impact and, and it shows up in the growth rate there. To finish, thank you. <clears throat>